So I want to take us to a very specific place and not really talk about all the things that are going to happen in the future or all the different things. And you've been great today. You've listened to a wide range of opportunities. It's been incredible. But now I want to focus on what I've really spent the last six years of my life on, which is to take a very specific oncology drug and get it to patients. And so uh, give me the next slide, please. So I think this is just a, a, no uh, disclaimer. Yeah, a disclaimer. So I'll let's go past that. And, and I want to talk about what's going on in immune oncology. And you don't need to be a oncologist to understand this. The immune system is complicated, that's true, but fundamentally it has two arms. And uh, so the first arm is, uh, is adaptive immunity. This is the T cells and antibodies we all know. Now you might be amazed to know that every therapeutic we have in immune oncology today is an adaptive immunity. Now, adaptive immunity is very important, but there's another arm of immunity. It's also very important. It's called innate immunity. It's called innate because it's in every cell in your body. Interestingly, cancer can turn off both sides of the immune system. And when it turns off innate immunity, none of the oncology therapies we have that stimulate the immune system work. So there has been a race to try and find the first good innate immune stimulator. And that's what I want to talk to you about. So give me the next, next slide. And this is really what we've been trying to do over the last years. Now, this is a more technical way to look at it, but it's also not that difficult. Innate immunity is called innate because it's in every cell in your body. And this is the innate immune pathway in a more scientific showing of it. And basically what innate immunity does is in the microenvironment of the cell, it is looking for cancer, it's looking for infection, basically foreign DNA of any kind. Cancer counts because it's in a leaky cell and it mutates DNA. And when it sees it, it keys the pathway. And the goal of the pathway is to create interferon. Interferon is that fever that you feel when you first get a cold or the flu. And interferon is released very locally and it immediately starts to fight the foreign DNA. And it calls to white blood cells to come and join the attack, which brings adaptive immunity. And it also keys your natural killer cells and a number of other immune fighters. So this is the way the two arms work together synergy, synergistically. Now, when cancer is able to block innate immunity and we can't turn it back on, no interferon is produced, there's no fever, white blood cells don't come to the area, and essentially the cancer is able to grow in stealth mode without your immune system seeing it in any way. And this happens actually in half of all tumors. So this is a huge problem. Now, what we do is we add our stimulator of innate immunity, our SR8541A. It's an ENPP1 inhibitor. ENPP1 is what cancers upregulate to block the system. What does ENPP1 do? Well, ENPP1 takes the second thing in the pathway, the second messenger, and it degrades it. And so what happens is the pathway doesn't produce interferon, it produces adenosine. Adenosine is actually very nasty. It's pro-metastatic, it's broadly immune suppressive, and it helps the cancer instead of hurting it. So the pathway is firing, your body is trying to attack the cancer, but all it gets is adenosine. So we want to fix that with our ENPP1 inhibitor, which blocks the ability of ENPP1 to do anything. It basically neuters it. And this is really important in a number of diseases, but the disease I want to talk about today is called microsatellite stable colorectal cancer. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Next slide. Now, here we go. So what is microsatellite stable colorectal cancer? Well, metastatic colorectal cancer is a terrible disease. 
85% of all colorectal cancer is microsatellite stable. What does that mean? Essentially, that means that the cancer can fix its DNA. So when we give chemotherapy, when we give a targeted therapy, we destroy the cancer's DNA. It doesn't kill the cancer. The cancer just fixes its DNA and continues on. You have a very resistant cancer with therapy. And this year, 153,000 Americans will receive this diagnosis of colorectal cancer and 53,000 will die from it. The five-year survival for metastatic colorectal cancer is about 13%. So 87% of people that get this diagnosis will die from it. Now there is therapy in development on the adaptive immune side. It's these two therapies called botencilumab and valcilumab. And they're very excited at Genius, the company that has these two agents, because they got to a 23% response. So 23% of patients did very well if they didn't have liver metastases. If they had liver metastases, they only have 7% response, which is pretty terrible. Well, what is this with and without liver mess thing? Well, colorectal cancer is cancer from your small intestine all the way down to your rectum. And so if the small intestine is where your cancer is, you'll likely metastasize to the lung. But if you're in the large colon where most colorectal cancer is, through the portal vein, you metastasize to the liver. So in the majority of MSSCRC, this regimen is not effective, but it is effective in a minority of that. But if we had our drug, to the bot bowel regimen as it's called, we think we can do much, much better. We think we can move that 23% up to 40%. And we think we can move that 7% up to 25 or so. And so I'm here to ask you to join me and help conquer this deadly cancer for many people. And I hope among you, there have been people that have been touched by this disease and see this as a worthy pursuit. Uh, next slide. Now, I'll just show you a little scientific data. This is all in mice, mice efficacy studies. But here, just with the botensilumab, so one of the two agents in a genesis regimen, we flatline colorectal cancer in this model, and all the mice survive in the combination purple regimen. Next slide. So then we do the triplet all three agents. And essentially what happens is we have pretty much complete cures. In fact, with all three agents, all but one mouse are completely cured of their cancer. Now we don't expect this result in people, but it's very gratifying that we have it in mice. So we're moving in the right direction and it's better than any other combination. So next slide. So now just to get to sort of the business side, I wanna assure you that there is a really good return for this kind of investment. And so first of all, I wanna say that we have great patent coverage. We have uh, four patents received, three patents in process. Uh, all patents are fully owned by Stingray. We have no economic obligations in university. We did all our own chemistry and biology. And each of the three scaffolds that we have is chemically distinct and independent. So we have great diversity across our platform. The next slide. So this just says uh, <clears throat> what we're doing and what our roadmap is. And so we think we can exit 2026. So we're about three years away. We're already in the clinic in Australia doing our phase one dose escalation study. We already have an efficacious dose at our first dose, and we think we'll be done with our second dose. That'll be the dose that we take in phase two. The thing is, in immune oncology, since the drug isn't directly cytotoxic, but it works by stimulating the immune system, we can start at much higher doses than you can in normal oncolytics where you have to maybe start seven doses down or something like that. So our drug has very little toxicity by itself. 
Financially, uh, I'm raising a $15 million Series A. We have raised about $9 million to date. We want another $15 million. This adds to the $2 million SPIR award that we received now fully uh, this last year. And the $14 million award from the Cancer Prevention and Research Institute of Texas that we just received last month that goes through the next three years and will help pay for the Balbot SR8541A trial, two thirds of it. So that's phenomenal. So we've been able to raise almost 16 million non-dilutive and about 9 million uh, in equity. And we're looking for another 15 and that's all we think we need. We're not really planning to do a series B, I can't promise anything. But we think this will give us the data we need to exit the big pharma and sell the program. Next slide. What was it about valuation? Uh, <clears throat> so our last valuation, our, our post money on our seed series three was about 22 million. And we want to raise this at around 29 million, which would give us a $5 share price. Okay. Now this. These are exits, historical exits in exactly my space. This is innate immune oncology exits. You can see the sellers and the buyers. And then every deal that's publicly available, I just average them all together. And that gives you an average up front of 250 million and a milestone package of almost 1.2 billion. So this is an incredibly lucrative space. Next slide. This is the competitive landscape. There are three compounds in the clinic. One is us, there are two others. We are the best in class compound and if we have time or questions, I can explain why. And there are four compounds which are about a year behind us, still preclinical, not in the clinic yet. Next slide. This is the team. Um, I have partnered now, this is my third company with Dr. Sunil Sharma, who's an eminent translational GI oncologist. This trial we wanna do is right in his wheelhouse. He's done over 150 phase one, phase two clinical trials. He's an investigator on the genus Balbot trial. So deeply experienced. Also Munil Shaw, who heads our clinical operations has been in immune oncology for the last 15 years across a number of companies. And the rest of the team really first rate. Next slide. So this is my last slide. We were the first company to start an ANPP1 inhibitor program for cancer. There was another mechanism that most companies chose to take forward that has pretty much failed. This is really a big potential opportunity. Colorectal cancer is a huge indication. We're not stopping with that. We're gonna do a couple other trials to make sure that we have you know, three shots on goal. And all of them are big potential indications. We have notable investors in the program, both in venture and in angels. So think about investing in a major impact drug that has real potential to change lives and change them soon. And join a proven team that's repeating their model with a leading program. So I hope you'll consider our program and I appreciate this time today with you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Yeah. So two clarifying questions. You said you're raising 15, but you raised nine of it, or you're raising the 15 on top of the nine to get to the total? 15, 15 on top of the nine. 15 on top of the nine. Yeah. The nine million I raised in three seed series rounds. So pre-A. Pre-A. That was at a, you said it was a 22 million post? On the last, the seed series three. And then the trials, they're FDA or you or are they outside of the US? Well, uh, so we are doing the single, we have to, according to, we haven't, first of all, we haven't accepted FDA, US, IMD, first point. Second point, we decided to go to Australia to do the single agent phase one because the drug is really designed to use the combination, but we, have to as required by FDA 
do a dose escalation as a single agent to prove safety. So we're doing that in all cancer patients in Australia, where we get Australia gives biotech companies 43% of the money they spend in Australia back. So we can do that trial for 2.2 million instead of 4 million by taking it to Australia. Then we will start second quarter of next year in the US with the triple combination. We have to do a dose escalation and combination and then a phase two. We have tremendous investigator enthusiasm. We're right now planning to start with MD Anderson and Texas Oncology in Dallas. And then for sort of our, for our health equity site, uh, Baylor, Scott and Whitey. So when do you envision going through phase three of FDA? Well, I don't envision going through phase three. I think I can sell it to pharma before that. So I want to sell it in 2026 based on the phase two data package to pharma. And I think I can get a deal similar to what I showed you. Yes, Last sir. question. Uh, is this sort of a binary outcome that your phase two data isn't good enough? Uh, we tank because you can't sell? Well, I plan to do three trials. So if all three tank, yes, then it's a binary negative option. But I think I have a great shot in all three trials. And I'm betting that at least one and maybe all of them will be successful. So what is your greatest risk in terms of these? I mean, obviously who, the, who, who enters these trials is critical in terms of the patient population. So where are you using AI or something for, to make sure you have the right patients in these trials that are gonna have the, the best profile for maximum output? How are you managing? Yeah, that? I'm not using AI, I'm using a fairly massive biomarker and tumor imaging program to make sure I know who's responding and who isn't. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, All right, thank you very much.